Well, I want to welcome everybody on behalf of FMC uh, for what I know will be an inspiring and interesting conversation with uh, FMC's 2021 Statesmanship Award honoree, Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Um, I'm Leonard Steinhorn, a professor of communication at American University and a CBS News political analyst on that wonderful medium of radio. Um, this is the second of FMC's uh, uh, four states statesmanship series discussions. The first uh, already happened with Representative Jim Clyburn and then to come with Senators Tim Scott and Chris Coons. Um, this award is an important one because it celebrates something at the very heart of our democracy. It celebrates public service to our country. It celebrates those who advance the principles and the institutions of our democracy and make sure that we do bequeath to the next generations a strong and vibrant society and political system. I uh, want to give special thanks to the supporters of FMC's Statesmanship Award Series and to FMC's institutional partners uh, who make this recognition of public service very possible. Now, I, uh, Representative Cheney uh, probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but allow me to say a few words about her. Um, you all know her as the lone House member representing Wyoming. She's in her third term, first elected in November of 2016. And you also probably know that she served for two years as the chair of the House Republican Conference, the third ranking Republican in the House. What many of you might not know is that she also served as the principal deputy assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affair Affairs, with particular focus on the Middle East and North Africa. She's also been a practicing attorney, a Fox News analyst, and is the co-author of the book, Exceptional, Why the World Needs a Powerful America. And her co-author is somebody everybody knows, her father, former Vice President Dick Cheney. Um, earlier this year, Forbes magazine included her in their 50 over 50 list of notable entrepreneurs, leaders, scientists, and creators. She's very proud of her Wyoming roots. Uh, she's a mom with five proud Wyoming children. And I quote what her bio on Twitter says, proud rodeo mom, <laughs> soccer mom, baseball mom, hockey mom. Uh, uh, welcome Congresswoman Cheney. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Steinhorn. It's great to be with you and, and uh, really honored to, to be uh, one of the recipients of the award this year. So thank you and, and, and thanks to the uh, former members of Congress and, and everything that you all do. So I really appreciate it. Well, very grateful for your time here. So um, I'm really uh, curious about your background. I read somewhere that when your father first ran for Congress in 1978, you were out there as a 12 year old handing out buttons and literature at campaign events. Uh, so tell us what it was like growing up in an outsized political family, how that inspired you, how that shaped your view of democracy and public service. Well, uh, thank you for the question. I, I really, um, I feel very blessed to, uh, to have both of the, the parents that, uh, that I have and, and to have grown up in, in this family. Um, and, and we certainly did. I mean, for us, campaigning was very much a family affair uh, and we all had our responsibilities. I, I passed out um, campaign buttons in particular, um, but, but my sister and I spent a lot of time going door to door and handing out pamphlets and riding in parades all across Wyoming. And, um, and, and some of my earliest memories are also, uh, you know, my dad, when he was uh, President Ford's chief of staff, uh, for example, um, he used to take Mary and me with him on the weekends because he was obviously busy. We didn't get to spend a lot of time together. He would take us uh, to his office on Saturday mornings. We'd have breakfast in the, the White House mess. And then uh, we would spend Saturday morning. Then this was the 1974-75. The sort of height of technology was he had uh, three or four TVs in the wall of the chief of staff's office. And it's still the chief of staff's office today. 
Um, and Mary and I could turn those TVs to different networks to watch multiple Saturday morning cartoons simultaneously, which we thought was, you know, super high tech at the time. Um, but, but um, you know, both my parents really instilled in, in us the, uh, both a, a love of history. Um, they're both obviously students of history um, and, and um, helped us really to understand the blessings of being Americans and, and also the responsibility and obligation of that. Um, and they, they also taught us that, that individuals can make a difference. And so I, I think, um, you know, I was drawn probably more to the policy side, I suppose, than necessarily the, the politics side, but, but I, I certainly love, um, love a political race and, and love engaging in, in the back and forth of that as well. So I think all of those things contributed to, um, you know, recognizing and understanding that it's a very worthy thing to, to be able to, to try to make a difference for our country. So what were those dinner table conversations like? Did you like talk about what, what it was like in school today or something going on in sports or television? Or did it focus a lot on the issues of the day? And that, you know, that sort of helped you focus yourself in terms of the things that you cared about? Well, it was, it was all of the above. Um, you know, my parents really, and, and I obviously understood this even more when I became a parent myself, but, but they had a a real way of making sure Mary and I knew, you know, whatever was going on sort of around our dinner table um, was the most important thing. And no matter what the drama was at school or, you know, anything else, what was happening at the dinner table and those conversations were, um, they just were, they grounded you. And um, I also remember though, that, that that's some of my earliest moments of understanding that there were stories that we would see on the news um, things that, you know, you would, you would see the descriptions that were, were, you know, uh, being conveyed on the news. And, and if it was something my dad had been involved in, he would talk to us about it. Um, and you would recognize that, that what had actually happened was very different from what you were seeing and hearing on the news. And I think that was, that was a realization that, that certainly has stayed with me to this day. Well, I will have to mention that to my uh, journalism students, uh, uh, given that context. <laughs> um, one more thing about your dinner table. Any guests at your dinner table that you say, gosh, I really remember those conversations? Well, I mean, there, there were many. Um, you know, I remember we, we were um, uh, able to spend time, for example, uh, up at Camp David with President Ford uh, on a number of occasions. And, and obviously... Um, you know, when, when my dad was working in both the Bush administrations. Um, when my dad was vice president, my, my mom and dad both made a real effort to have historians come to the vice president's residence um, and, and, you know, to have the chance to talk about, you know, the Civil War with Jay Winnick, for example, um, Michael Beschloss talking about, um, uh, you know, American presidents and, and their history. Um, Stephen Ambrose was somebody not at the vice president's residence, but but years before that that we'd spent time with. But so just the the chance to to speak to historians, um, particularly those who'd been working on American history. So it's always interesting to me to see the sort of flows and influences on public figures. Um, and another part of you is Wyoming. Uh, as a, a Wyoming person might sing, Wyoming on my mind, right? Um, but, you know, it's that pride in your state that motivates you as much as anything else. So tell us a bit more about how Wyoming, growing up in that particular state, sort of shaped your view of the world. I mean, how did growing up there versus, let's say, growing up in New York or California uh, uh, make you uh, Liz Cheney? Well, Wyoming is, uh, is a very special place. And um, my, um, my great grandfather and his brother, uh, ran away from home, uh, and, and ended up in Wyoming in 1917. Um, and they started out, uh, basically as, as cowboys, working cowboys, and, um, then, you know, spent time in the Salt Creek oil fields. And, and that's where my grandmother was raised. Um, and my grandmother also, we have a wonderful family picture of the Natrona County Sheriff's Department. Um, and there are about 50 men in the picture. It's probably 1958 or 59. And my grandmother is the only woman 
Uh, she was the only female, the first female deputy sheriff in Natrona County, Wyoming. Um, and, and so I think, um, you know, Wyoming is, has always been a place where um, people's values, um, they, they live them. You know, it's a place where you had to be very tough to make it, certainly in the early days in Wyoming. Um, you had to be able to rely on your neighbors um, and, and people are, are fiercely independent, self-sufficient. Um, we're the first place uh, in the nation, even before we were a state, women had the right to vote in Wyoming. Um, and so it is, it's a, it's a place that really reflects the code of the West, reflects the importance of grit and honor uh, and honesty. And, and I think those are all, all things that really, um, you know, are, are hugely important in terms of um, the, the kinds of things that I, I always say Washington would benefit to have more of. Um, and, and they're very um, you know, interesting and, and unique in some ways issues that we deal with in Wyoming and, and not totally unique because there are other big public land states, obviously, but you know, I find people are always surprised when um, you know, I explain that 50% of our land in Wyoming is owned by the federal government and um, even more of our minerals. And so when you know, uh, an administration, people in Washington say they're gonna ban oil and gas leasing on, on public lands, has a huge impact on us, a huge devastating impact on our communities. Um, but but I, I really, one of the things that I love the most is having the opportunity to, to bring people to Wyoming who've never visited before. Um, I think it's the most beautiful place on earth. Um, and, and it's a place that really reflects the best of America. And I'm tremendously honored to be able to represent Wyoming in Congress. And representing uh, Wyoming in Congress, you obviously have lots of conversations with your constituents. Um, what's on their minds these days? You know, what do they want to hear from you? What do you talk about with them? Well, there are many things. Um, I think, first of all, real concern about uh, some of the policies of the new administration. Uh, you know, we benefited tremendously in Wyoming from uh, the tax policy of the Trump administration, from the deregulation that we saw in particular. Uh, and there's been a real effort to reverse course on some of those policies. Um, people are very worried about spending. We've seen uh, you know, the, the um, trillions of dollars in appropriations in the first months of the Biden administration. Um, there, there also is a lot of concern about um, uh, the extent to which um, people feel like, and, and I agree with this, that we aren't, we aren't really teaching our kids about American history anymore. And there's a real sense of, you know, we've sort of come to a point in the country where we're expecting the next generation to be able to stand up for, um, you know, the, the blessings that we have, um, but we haven't equipped them uh, to be able to do that in too many ways. So education is a big issue as well. Um, and, and I, certainly we have a lot of conversations around um, what happened after the election, what Donald Trump did on January 6th and before, uh, my impeachment vote, uh, you know, uh, those, those are all are also part of, the, uh, of almost every conversation I have at home these days. Now, it's a conservative state, um, and, but not everyone there is conservative. Uh, and so what about those conversations with people who share your pride in the state, but don't, don't always share your views? How do you have those interactions and, uh, with, with those constituents and try and help them understand where you are and listen to them and see how you can potentially bake in some of their concerns into how you represent them? Well, I think that... Um... You know, Wyoming is a place partly because it's a small population and um, so many of us know, you know, so many of the others of us, you know, people have family connections and uh, community connections. Um, and so one thing that I think is true about Wyoming is, you know, when, when you know that you're going to be seeing people, uh, you know, at, at the high school rodeo or, you know, on, on the baseball field, uh, or at church, you know, when you, so many of the interactions in Wyoming are face-to-face, -face, they're personal, they're individual, um, you're much less likely to be sort of harshly attacking somebody. It's, it's I think there's much more of uh, the sense, there has been the sense of, you know, we need to try to work together. We aren't gonna agree on everything. 
let's talk about where we agree and and see where we can go and recognize where we aren't going to agree but but you don't need to be you know vitriolic about it um you know the, let's let's try to get some things done and and so I think that's an important part of, of Wyoming. Look, I think that's something we need as a country to get back to. Um, we have to be able to recognize we, we ought to have really vigorous um, policy debates and not shy away from the differences, uh, but, but know that we aren't enemies. You know, we're having a policy debate and, um, and we ought to be able to, to ultimately do what's right for the country, not treat our political opponents like, you know, we're somehow enemies. So what you're saying is we need a little bit more of Wyoming and the rest of the country. Is that it? A lot, a lot more. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, take that and translate it to uh, uh, Congress um, in terms of reaching across the aisle. I'm curious if you can talk about the times that you've worked with Democrats to find common ground on issues and legislation and, you know, how that's played out. Yeah. Look, I am. Um, when I first got to Congress, and I'm sure many of the, the former members uh, have done the same thing. Uh, I um, made a real effort in my first, you know, uh, term in office in particular, when I was on the House floor to go and sit down next to somebody I didn't know uh, on either side of the aisle. And, and to, to do that, to, to just introduce myself, to learn who they were, to strike up a conversation. And I found without exception um, that, that every single person I talked to and met that way had a really interesting life story. Um, they had really good reasons why they were in Congress, why they had run for Congress. Might've been somebody I totally disagreed with completely, um, but, but really interesting people. And, and I'll tell you one, one story. Um, that's how I met Jamie Raskin. Um, and Jamie and I were actually, uh, as I recall, standing by one of the, the boxes uh, to vote. Um, and we just, struck up a conversation. He's a constitutional law professor. And he said to me, you know, I've written several books. And I was asking him about his books. And, and I said, well, could you send me one of your books? And, and he was quiet for a moment. He said, well, I'm not going to send you my most recent book. And I said, well, why not, Jamie? He said, because that one is about how George Bush and Dick Cheney stole the election in 2000. <laughs> I said, okay, I don't need to see that one. <laughs> you can send me another one. Um, but but so just, in, you know, from the perspective of getting to know people personally. Um, and then I, I've worked with um, a number of my colleagues, I'd say probably particularly on the, on the Armed Services Committee, um, which tends to be um, a less partisan committee than some others. Um, but, you know, people like Jason Crow, for example, uh, on issues connected to Afghanistan, um, uh, there are a number of my other colleagues on that committee who we've had discussions since January 6th about what do we need to do to help make sure members of Congress, um, you know, have all of the training and information they need about the Constitution and how that works. Um, uh, we've talked about what we could do potentially to put together civics education programs um, for students around the country. I think there's real bipartisan support for that. Um, and then other areas, China is another area where I think there's pretty significant bipartisan support. Um, I've just recently introduced a bill, a telehealth bill, co-sponsored with Debbie Dingell to help extend some of the abilities people have had during the pandemic to get access to telehealth services. So there are a lot of areas where I think we can work together and, and agree uh, and, and we should. So what you're saying is that, yes, you may have passionate disagreements with people, but it's, there's a human side to those connections that doesn't often get represented in the news. Um, that what we may see on cable is not necessarily representative of what we see on the floor of the house. Absolutely. And, and I think cable wants to portray um, much more dissension. Now, look, I, I think you, it is absolutely true that, that, the, the mood is very different since January 6th. Um, uh, but, um, but there are many more stories of members working together and, and trying to do so for the common good than, than get reported uh, in the news. 
Well, I'm sure you've talked with your dad about what it was like to serve in Congress during his days. So, you know, how were things different from when he served for uh, up, up to now? Or, or are things different? I think they are different. Um, you know, one big difference is when my dad was in Congress, um, everybody's families, really not everybody's, but most people's families came to Washington. And so that meant, you know, the, the kids were here during the school year, maybe back home in the summertime. And, and when families are in Washington and people's families get together um, and the spouses are friends, there are a lot of friendships across party lines. Uh, and, and that also affects, I think, in a positive way, how business gets done. Um, look, I also think that uh, there, there, there was a level of seriousness that um, we, we, not that we don't have serious members now, because we certainly do, but, but I think the rise of social media um, has meant that we have a, a lot more members who than, than we used to, who aren't serious and who sort of come to Washington to try to be social media stars. And, um, uh, and we need more people who are actually gonna come to Washington and do their homework and uh, you know, who are here because they wanna legislate and they wanna get things done. And, and I do have the impression that, you know, that that's a difference. Um, you know, I don't, I probably shouldn't sort of draw with such a, a broad brush, but, um, but I think a real commitment to legislating. Look, I also think co Congress seems to me to be pretty broken right now. And, you know, when, when you have um, a $1.9 trillion appropriations bill that, you know, gets an hour, essentially, I think it was about an hour of debate on the floor of the House, um, uh, no markup, no, no committee hearing, um, that's not legislating, and 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 that's that's not the way that the house ought to operate. And so I think there are some some fundamental things we need to be doing um, to get back to a time when there was real legislating going on and real debate, and, and when things weren't just because of the rules able to be be rammed through on a partisan basis. And I assume you're saying you know a pox on both parties for doing stuff like that, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, I, the Democrats are in charge now. Um, but, but I, I think, look, and I, I think you probably have to go back, um, you know, a number of years to some of the reforms that, that, you know, took some of the power away from committee chairs, for example. Um, I also think the term limits on committee chairs that the Republicans have, the Democrats don't, there are benefits, but, but, there are also really big downsides to that. I mean, if you look at members like uh, Mac Thornberry, Mike Conaway, um, people who, you know, term limited out of their committee chairmanships, they, they were really good, serious members. And, and I think we do need to look at that and look at the, the negative consequences of what happens. And I understand you wanna open up opportunities for young people and that's important for new members and we need to, to refresh the, the membership, but, but we also need to value the expertise and the experience and the judgment of members who've been there longer. So what would be some of the other changes or recommendations that you would offer to make Congress work better? Well, I, I would go back to the days. I, I would give the committee chairs more authority, more power. Um, I, I would, uh, you know, actually go back to um, legislating, to requiring, you know, I'm trying to remember, for example, when was the last time we had an open rule on anything on the floor? And I was just talking last week to Frank Lucas. Um, I think the farm bill that he ran back, maybe it was 2005, had an open rule on it. And, you know, there were reasons that weren't necessarily positive that they decided that would have an open rule. But even just the idea that you could offer, you know, any amendment that, that uh, you wanted to could be offered, that you wouldn't be restricted. Um, you know, I think that's important. Uh, I, would, I would end proxy voting. I think right now, you know, I, I was opposed to it when it began, um, but, but I think now we're in a situation where um, you really, you, you can't have, um, uh, real legislating happening if one member can vote for 10 others. Um, if, you know, committee hearings continue to be hybrid, they don't really need to be anymore. I think we need people back um, in place. 
I also would, would fundamentally change our schedule. Congress's schedule makes no sense. Um, you know, we end up being in session for four days and huge amount is kind of crammed into the four days and then we're out of session for weeks at a time. Um, I think that having a much more regular uh, uh, schedule in terms of getting work done uh, would, would help a lot. And then I think there are a whole bunch of issues connected to the appropriations process and, you know, whether we should be looking at two-year appropriations for some things like the defense budget um, and others that, that I think are, are important that we ought, to, we ought to really give serious thought to. And it's interesting. I heard a lot of these recommendations when I co-authored the uh, FMC publication, Congress at a Crossroads. Um, but one of the conflicts that a lot of uh, former members talked about was, yeah, these all things all make sense, but they might give the minority party more voice and more say and more power. And so therefore there's that conflicting pressure in the majority to hold on to the majority and do nothing to advantage or give a voice to let's say a member of Congress who's more vulnerable. So there's a desire to change, but a, a sort of a, a sense that you need to keep holding on to power. Therefore you don't want to change. Is that sort of a correct assessment of the dilemma that a lot of you face? I, I think that, you know, it, it Yes, I think that that you have, uh, you know, when you you've got the elections every two years, um, and the way that these campaigns run now, as soon as the new Congress begins, both parties are, you know, making sure they're protecting their vulnerable members and targeting everybody else's vulnerable, the other side's vulnerable members, um, and and I so I think the politics begins sort of right away. There's no question about that, um, but but I I think that. Um, ultimately, if you're thinking about what's good for the country, and if you're thinking about, you know, there, there are certain um, sort of standards and characteristics of teams or businesses, for example, that, that are excellent. You know, when, when you've got groups of people functioning at, as best they can and at their highest capability, uh, there are some characteristics that you know, are, are true of all of them. And I would say Congress is very far right now from operating that way. And so, you know, the, the American people deserve better and they deserve um, House representatives and a, and a Senate that functions in, in the way that the framers intended in terms of actually uh, legislating. I think we've also given away, and I, I'm somebody who believes in a strong executive, but, but I think the way we function now where Congress is out of session and the president is signing executive orders, um, you know, uh, has, has gotten to a point where we have given away a lot of the authorities that are supposed to be vested in Congress. And, and that's something we need to get back as well. Well, let's shift for a moment to one of your areas of expertise. So let's say you happen to have President Biden's ear on global and foreign policy issues. Um, what would you advise him? I mean, what are those things that most concern you? What are the things that you think ought to be priorities? Where do you think we need to put our sort of energy and resources? So sort of educate us here on, on sort of the Liz Cheney uh, advice to Joe Biden. <laughs> well, um, I would say do not attempt to re-enter the Iranian nuclear accords. Um, I think I would, I would start from a strategic perspective and, and um, you know, reiterate and, and Vice President or President Biden is somebody who has been involved in foreign policy, you know, for a long time. Um, so this wouldn't be news to him. But, but I do think, you know, taking a step back and thinking about America's strategic role in the world and, and what does America need to do in order to maintain that role in the world. I believe America has to lead. I believe that, you know, if, if we aren't setting the rules of the road globally, you know, you'll have China and a global surveillance state stepping in to fill the void. I think they already are attempting to do that clearly. But, but we have to recognize and understand America's deterrent power um, and, and, and recognize that uh, it's weakness that's provocative. So, um, you know, that to me means we've got to ensure that we're investing in our military. Uh, we've got to make sure that our adversaries know that we actually have capabilities that are superior to theirs. We have capabilities that um, uh, will allow us to defend ourselves, uh, but also that we have the will to use them. And, 
And I think that's very important. I think that sometimes, you know, there's a sense of, well, the United States is provocative if it suggests that, you know, it, it has such military capabilities, but, but the, the opposite is actually true. Um, so I'd like to see us get back to a time when, um, you know, we were willing to stand up for freedom. We were willing to um, defend our allies uh, and that we were very clear about that. Um, and, and I think that means that we have to invest significantly more than the Biden administration's budget, for example, does with respect to the Defense Department. Um, we, have to, we have to get to a place, I think most Americans, if you said to them, how do you think America decides how much money to spend on defense? They would probably say, well, we figure out what the threats are and then we decide how much money we need to defeat the threats or to protect ourselves against the threats. And that isn't how it works at all. You know, what happens is, you know, this process of the Defense Department sort of bakes in the politics and, and everybody has their own interests about what weapon systems they want to defend. Um, and what priorities they have. And by the time the budget gets to Congress, Congress is looking at something that already is political. And so we don't, we're not really forced to confront the choices we're making if we appropriate too little. But then we also are broken in, in terms of our appropriations process. So we usually are you know, passing a continuing resolution. Um, so you know, I, I would say a very clear focus on China is very important. Uh, focus on Russia is very important. Um, I, I think the summit that the president had with Putin um, ended up, it doesn't seem like there was huge damage done, but I also think it was a mistake to do that. I think that presidents have to recognize, and, and this was true when, when President Trump went and met with Kim Jong-un, for example. I think presidents need to recognize that a meeting with an American president um, is a, a huge validating event for foreign leaders. And um, I think we need to, you know, deal with Putin uh, as he is, um, which is an adversary, somebody who uh, certainly um, does not wish the United States well, somebody who's attacked us uh, in terms of the, the hacks that we've seen recently. Um, but so I, I think it's important for our adversaries and our allies to recognize um, that we're gonna defend our interests. And, and that's the best way to keep the peace is if they don't miscalculate and, and think maybe we won't. Now, one of the things China uses is not just its sort of growing military presence, um, but its soft power economically. Um, uh, do you think that over the last 10 or 20 years, we've used our soft power economically effectively over the world uh, uh, through trade and other relations? Um, because China is making inroads in parts of the world that sort of they're playing the long game. So how do you sort of deal with sort of trading economic issues that also have a big impact worldwide? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's important for us to do uh, with respect to China is make sure that, that people recognize, um, you know, the, the cost of those economic relationships. And, and I don't, you know, I, I don't think that there isn't a moral equivalent in terms of you know, a trading relationship that a country might have with the United States versus a trading relationship they have with China. Um, you know, the, the extent to which you're now watching uh, the, the Chinese government, for example, export its surveillance technology or demand intellectual property rights, um, you know, or, you know, as they loan money to, company, to countries around the world for, you know, what they describe as commercial projects there's usually a defense um, angle to those and certainly uh, predatory lending practices at a global scale. So I think, um, I think that we did, uh, both parties did get China wrong. And I think both parties thought, you know, 20 years ago that as, as we watched China open up economically, we would see that they would be compelled to open up politically. But because that technology was sort of uh, arriving on the scene that allows them to, to conduct surveillance of every single individual in their society, um, because they you know, uh, are, are involved in uh, you know, what seems to be very clear genocide, the concentration camps uh, with respect to the Uyghurs, 
um, you know, that they've been, they've been able um, for a whole number of reasons not to open up politically and in fact to go in some ways uh, in the wrong direction. And, and so I think it's, we're now, we have to confront this. I think COVID um, shined a, a spotlight on the nature of the Chinese Communist Party, what they're willing to do. Um, the fact that they allowed uh, individuals to travel from uh, Wuhan province globally, but didn't allow them to travel throughout China is a big indicator that they knew very early on what they were dealing with. And, and you know, I, I think um, it's important for us, and I do think it's important for us to have an investigation. I think that it's important for us to understand, um, you know, if, if, if the Chinese government knew that they were um, spreading this deadly virus around the world, which they did, there's no, no question that they knew that, um, you know, I think there's, there's some possibility it was intentional, that, that they understood what they were dealing with. They knew how devastating the virus would be, and they made a calculation, clearly, you know what, let's go ahead and let this spread around the world so everybody has to deal with it, it's not just us. Um, and I think that's one of many questions that, that need to be answered. But I think what, what the virus has done is it has opened the eyes of a lot of countries around the world about the real nature of the Chinese government. And um, has helped us to um, educate people about what, what we're confronting and work with allies to begin to do things like move supply chains um, and, and ensure that we can be uh, less dependent on, on the Chinese government as a whole. So uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I want to go back to something you talked about earlier, which is civics. Um, you have five children, and one of the greatest gifts we can give our kids is a healthy democracy. And so what would you like to say to this next generation about the role they need to play in sustaining and nourishing our democracy? You've talk and talked a lot lately about democracy, uh, the integrity of our democratic institutions. So give us your brief civics lesson here. Well, you know, I think, um, I think it's important for young people to realize that and important for us to convey to them, number one, how, how unusual it is in all of world history um, to get to live in a country where we choose our, our leaders and where we you know, decide what our laws are gonna be. Most people in most places um, on earth throughout most of history have not been able to do that. Um, uh, we, we can. And, um, and, and what that means is that, that we all have an obligation um, to defend that system. And I think that what we've all lived through, I mean, I, I, there was a moment, um, after the impeachment uh, in the house, when I was having dinner with our two younger children and, and my husband, and, and I looked across the table at my sons and, and I had this realization of, um, you know, we grew up in a country where we took for granted the peaceful transfer of power. And, and I wondered for a moment whether I was gonna be able to say that about my children. You know, will they grow up in a country where they can count on the peaceful transition of power? And, to me, that, that's our most solemn obligation. You know, um, we don't have a republic if power um, is decided by violence. And so I think teaching our children what previous generations have done so that we can live in a republic, um, teaching our children about, you know, the bravery and the courage in unknown circumstances, um, the sacrifices that great leaders uh, have made is really important. I think it's it's one of the things that's that's really unfortunately devastating about you know not teaching um, you know the, the the great books, not teaching about the great leaders, um, and no no leader is perfect. Um, but you know certainly if you look back at the founding, um, that concentration of genius. Um, in, you know, colonial backwaters basically was miraculous and something that we all should be very proud of, but, but something that gives us a duty and an obligation. Um, and history is also great. I mean, when my sister and I were young, my dad took us to Civil War battlefields um, all across the East. And uh, at the time, we grumbled a lot about it, but it was really... Um, something I, I treasure, memories I treasure and have tried to, to teach my own kids. But 
And the last thing I would say about it is um, I, young people really should know that each one of them, each individual one of them can make a difference. And it, that can seem unlikely because our country's so big and our government is so big, but that is actually the only thing that makes a difference is individuals. And, and so each one of them can um, and should, and it's, uh, it's really, so it's a wonderful blessing to be able to, to work on, on behalf of the United States. I think it was Robert Kennedy in his South Africa speech who talked about the acts of individuals create a mighty tide of change. And I think that's basically what that's you're right. saying, right? That's yeah. right. He said it, he said it far better, but that's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, we're just about out of time. Any final thoughts you want to share? Well, just again, thank you very much um, for, for uh, the honor and thank you for taking the time today. Um, and, and thanks to, to all the former members for their service and their continued service uh, to the country. Um, and, and please continue to be engaged and involved. Um, these issues that we're, we're dealing with now should be above partisanship and, uh, um, and we'll take all of us to, to make sure things turn out right. Well, I want to thank you, Congresswoman Cheney. Uh, congratulate you on uh, being a Statesmanship Award honoree. Uh, I want to thank all of the attendees who uh, uh, stayed with us during this very interesting, informative, and engaging conversation, and all of the sponsors uh, for FMC's 2021 Statesmanship Award series who have made this possible. So thanks so much for your service, your wisdom, your thoughts, and your dedication to our democracy. Thank you. Thank you.